Hi, I'm Dr. Michael Gartner, double board certified plastic surgeon. And today we're gonna to review this video. Do you know these incredible facts about your body? It's so stay tuned, this is very educational. So let's start at the beginning, like the actual beginning of your creation. During climax, a male can release 125 to 750 million sperm cells. And that is made possible because the testes are pretty much making about 3,500 sperm cells per second. That is kind of interesting. It takes about 64 days to produce a sperm cell. And then the sperm gets stored in the epididymis where they mature till they are stored ejaculation. However, a female usually releases only one ovum or egg from this structure, the ovary, per month. And you have two ovaries in the body. So as you can see, the human body is taking no risks by sending millions of eager swimming suitors on a quest to find and fertilize that prized ovum. Now, if you thought the rate of sperm cell production was impressive, your red blood cells are about to show those flagellated cells who's boss. Because your red bone marrow, found in your spongy bone, produces 2 million red blood cells per second. Clearly, these oxygen-carrying cells are very important. But what is interesting is that the rate of red blood cell production is actually necessary to balance the equally high rate of red blood cell breakdown. And about 1% of the red blood cells are produced per day. The human heart beats about 2.5 to 3 billion times over a lifetime. Given that the heart pumps around 2,000 gallons or 7,570 liters of blood per day, this means over a lifetime, it's pumping around 55 million gallons or 208 million liters. That's crazy. Now the effectiveness of a heart is basically uh, measured by its cardiac output. The cardiac output is the amount in the ventricle, which is the lower chamber, especially the left ventricle, that it produces in one minute. There's an equation where you can actually measure this, where the cardiac output is equal to the heart rate, how many times your heart beats uh, per minute, and stroke volume, which is the volume of uh, ejected per beat. So if you increase your heart rate, uh, your stroke volume increases, you increase your cardiac output. The athletes can actually measure this, and uh, if you're training, you can measure this. And the average is around four to eight liters per minute of cardiac output. That's a lot of blood. The uterus is the largest smooth muscle mass in the body, and in the non-pregnant female, it is about the size of an inverted pear. And you can see about half of the uterus right here. But during pregnancy, the uterus increases its weight by 22-fold, and since we're talking about fruit, gets to the size of a watermelon, which means it grows and shifts all of these other organs, like the small intestine, the liver that you can see here, and the stomach, all shifting upward to accommodate this watermelon-sized uterus during baby time. That's amazing. Now, it takes about 12 weeks for it to become like a grapefruit, and then about another 20 weeks to become a smaller melon uh, until it becomes uh, the watermelon size during pregnancy. And at that time, it weighs the muscle portion of the uterus, weighs about two pounds. And then after pregnancy, it shrinks back down to its pear shape. If you could unfold your respiratory tubes within the lungs and lay them flat, you would get a surface area of around 75 square meters, roughly the size of a racquetball court. This is due to the respiratory passageways having 23 generations. And what that means is that we get a lot of branching of these tubes. The trachea is the first tube. It then splits into the primary bronchi here, which is the second generation. And then we get a split into the lobar bronchi, which is the third generation. And this happens 23 times all the way down to these tiny small tubes called alveolar ducts and these alveolar ducts dilate into what looks like a cluster of grapes called alveoli. And there are 300 to 500 million alveoli found in the lungs. Now that's really important that it has a huge surface area for gas exchange. Now the bronchial tree has about 10,000 square meters in the adult, and that's what's needed uh, for gas exchange. That's a lot of surface area to exchange as much oxygen and carbon dioxide as possible. The spinal cord doesn't actually travel the entire length of your vertebral column. It ends around L1, L2, which if you look closely, you can see the very end and the tip of it right at the tip of my probe. Now it starts at the base of the skull, which is an area called the foramen magnum. And then it becomes a bundle of nerves that continue down. This bundle of nerves, look how cool this is, is called the cauda equina, which translates to horse's tail. And it continues 
down towards the sacrum and the coccyx, innervating everything downstream. Now the average length is 40 to 45 centimeters or 15.7 to 17.7 .7 inches. Obviously that varies males to females. Males are usually in general taller, so their spinal cord's a little longer. The average amount of blood that the heart of a non-trained person can pump per minute is about 15 liters. But with an elite endurance athlete, the heart can pump up to 40 liters per minute. That just goes to show that with consistent training, the heart can improve its strength and pumping capacity dramatically. Yeah, so um, as you train, it has enhanced contractility, enhanced filling, and uh, it becomes more efficient, the chamber itself, and that's why athletes become uh, more efficient. And the average beat has about 70 mLs or 2.4 ounces per beat. So all that adds up to a lot of fluid being pumped around. The human body is made up of trillions of cells. However, there are estimates that only one in 10 of those cells are human meaning we have many more microorganisms living on and within us than our own human cells, and this makes up what is known as the microbiome. And many of these microorganisms live in your colon, and they play a major role in proper functioning of the digestive system and digestive system health. Now, they also live on skin, nasal area, oral area, the, the esophagus, they also are in the genital urinary system. When we talk about microbiomes though, currently they're talking mostly about the gut and gut health issues. All these areas can affect, uh, if the microbiomes are thrown off in any one of these areas, skin, nasal, it can lead to uh, decreased barrier protection, higher infections, and a host of other issues. Determining how many skin cells we lose per day is actually more difficult than you might imagine, but it's often cited that we lose anywhere from 30 to 40,000 skin cells per minute. This would mean we're losing around 1.8 to 2.4 million skin cells every hour, which translates to be between 43.2 to 57.6 million skin cells every single day. Wow, that's crazy. And it takes 30 days for one skin cell to develop and then it goes away. But where does it go? Where do you think it goes? Well, interestingly enough, most of the household dust in your house is made from your own dead skin cells. <laughs> is that crazy? <laughs> so be sure to clean your bed sheets often. This is the largest artery in the human body, called the aorta, and it's the size of a garden hose and the start of blood flow from the heart. And from this, the blood vessels will branch into one of the most extensive and efficient irrigation systems ever created. Now, the aorta is over uh, one foot long, and in its widest area, it's over um, one inch thickness in diameter. Think about getting oxygen and nutrients to trillions of cells, and it's estimated that if all the individual blood vessels were placed end to end, they would extend for about 60,000 miles, roughly three times the circumference of the Earth. So yeah, 60,000 miles of tubing just hanging out in your body. Your kidneys filter about 190 liters or 50 gallons of blood per day, but most of that is just filtered and reclaimed because you certainly don't pee 190 liters per day, as that would be a major problem, because typically we only produce about one to two liters of urine each day. The kidneys also have important function in controlling blood pressure. Uh, producing red cells, they produce erythropoietin, which is a very important uh, in producing red blood cells, and they also control the pH of the body, in addition to doing their filtering waste and blood every day. Now here's something crazy to think about. The most complex body system, the nervous system, only weighs about 4.5 pounds, with the brain taking up about 3 pounds of that total weight. Which on average, for the average person, the whole brain neurosystem is about 3% of the body weight. Now if you ask me, that's a system that's definitely carrying its weight. The human eye blinks around 15 times per minute, which equates to 900 blinks per hour, 21,600 per day, and around 7.9 million per year. This is accomplished by this cool muscle here called the orbicularis oculi. Now the orbicularis oculi starts basically in the uh, brainstem, transmission nerve patches, and then it goes through the trigeminal nerve towards the orbiculus oculi. Not only does this orbicularis oculi contract a lot, 
It also is one of the fastest muscles in the human body. The blinking is also important for lubrication, cleansing, and has a protective issue as well. And if you were impressed with the orbicularis oculi muscle, you may also be impressed with the extraocular muscles that attach to and move the eye. These are also some of the fastest muscles in the human body. Because if something comes flying towards your face, you want to be able to react like an anatomical ninja. And continuing with speed, neural impulses travel through nerves at speeds up to 250 miles per hour or 402 kilometers per hour. This speed varies depending on the myelination, the fatty wrapping that some neurons have. So yeah, so the longer nerves, which are myelinated, which have this specialized insulation, travel that fast, amazing quick speed. Other unmyelinated nerves, such as uh, pain fibers, travel slower. They usually travel at 1.1 to 4.5 miles per hour. Now these larger, quicker nerves are used for touch and proprioception, which gives us that sense of body position. But still, 250 miles per hour? That's ridiculous. The stomach is the most distensible portion of the GI tract, meaning that it can stretch the most and so it can accommodate a large amount of food. And part of this has to do with these folds inside the stomach called gastric rugi that allow for the stomach to stretch and expand. Now for us mere mortals, we may be able to stuff up to 1.5 liters of food in there, but the competitive eaters can put as much as 6.4 liters of food in the stomach. But the rugae are also important for uh, nutrient absorption, also food mixing and propulsion as well. If someone were to have their heart removed from their chest, you know, kind of like Kano does from Mortal Kombat, or we should probably do it more appropriately, say like through a surgical procedure, the heart could actually continue to beat for around three minutes. That's because the heart is capable of what's known as self-excitation or autorhythmicity. And this is because of the nature of the cardiac muscle fibers that make up the heart, as well as the heart having a built-in pacemaker that gives it the ability to repeatedly generate spontaneous action potentials. And this is completely independent of the brain, although the brain does play a role at times. But if the heart does have a hard time beating on its own, you can always add a pacemaker like we have with this heart. Now the interesting thing is that the heart stops beating when it's outside the body, when it runs out of energy, or ATP. ATP is the energy-driven source of all our uh, cells, and that's another discussion. But heart transplants has taken advantage of that. So what they do is they cool the heart with ice special solutions uh, so that it doesn't use that ATP energy that's inside the heart once it's taken out, they put it in that ice chest, fly it in that Lear jet quickly to the next place where they put it in a new person's body, hook it up, so then that person produces ATP, which gives the heart energy. So they always want to transplant that heart quickly before it runs out of ATP energy. An average adult produces about one liter of saliva each day. And here's the largest of the three salivary glands called the parotid gland for your viewing pleasure. But if you're producing one liter of saliva each day, that means over a year, you produce 365 liters or about 96 gallons of saliva. Over a lifetime, that's around 28,000 liters or 7,400 gallons. That's a lot of fluid. Now that can vary depending on if you have dehydration, your diet spice tends to increase uh, saliva production, and also the time of the day. We produce more saliva in the afternoon than we do in the morning enough to fill 90 bathtubs with spit. A person that is untrained or unacclimatized can produce about one liter of sweat per hour when exercising and or when exposed to a very hot and humid environment. However, when that person becomes more fit and or acclimatized to the hot and humid environment, the sweat glands can adapt to produce up to two to three liters of sweat per hour. That's quite the improvement in one's thermoregulatory capacity. So also um, that uh, basically athletic people sweat more uh, than non-athletic people. Uh, where you live in the equator can affect that, hot or cold. So there are varying factors that affect that as well. Remember when we started at the beginning today with millions of sperm cells searching for that one ovum? When the one sperm cell reaches and fertilizes the ovum, we get a complete cell with all the necessary chromosomes. 
and we call this cell a zygote. Now, once a zygote uh, divides itself, then basically it cleaves and becomes a morula. And then uh, basically it becomes an embryo once it's implanted into the uterus. And that's when pregnancy starts, which is usually about eight weeks. And then we're on our way to develop a fetus and a human being. Now here's what is crazy. The zygote then grows and divides into an embryo. Then the embryo becomes an incredible fetus that you can see here. And then we become this full grown human with friends, family, life experiences, memories, and all the fully functional structures that we talked about today. And that all started with one cell. Crazy, one cell. So there you go, there are some uh, really uh, incredible facts about the human body. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. So if you like these videos, uh, hit the like button and then subscribe and there'll be more on the way.